few years ago, I was asked to speak to the induction of all the new PhD students this year, which was pre-pandemic. And I thought, you know, how, how can I sort of make my mark and how can I, you know, in a very kind of uh, engaging way, give an idea of the different aspects of research. So I wish I could do it. If you'd give me 10 minutes more notice, I would have done it. I'm yeah. sorry. So I showed a bit of Indiana Jones <laughs> um, uh, from the Last Crusade. And I don't, I don't know those of you have seen it, but yeah. Of course, Lucas has, yeah, working, <laughs> working on genre fiction. <laughs> yes, give me a semiotic breakdown in the next 30 seconds. Oh, the <laughs> yeah. How many genres does it cover? Uh, I bet I can predict what he's going to talk about. He's going to talk about Sean Connery and Henry Jones Jr. looking at the manuscript page. You know, all I've things. told you this before. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's got a better memory than me. So there's, so Indiana Jones, is, is it, he's, he's been chased, obviously. You know, there's this great chase scene where he's on, you know, on a circus train and all this. You know, he's got his hat and he's very quick. You know, and this is all, of course, because he's, you know, he's devoted to his archaeological research, isn't he? You know, getting these moot in, of course, which is what archaeology is at one level. You know, I have a PhD student working on mummy fiction. You know, uh, Jay, as some of you know, Jay Sullivan. Uh, Sullivan. And, you know, we keep coming around to this issue. This is a digression, of course. But <laughs> in the great literary tradition of digressions, going back to Christian Shandy, which is all digressions. Um, and, um, and all these stories keep sort of questioning morally, ethically, you know, robbing graves, basically, taking these uh, mummies, which are then, because it's Gothic mummy fiction, exert their revenge, don't they? Although in the Hammer Horror tradition, it's always... Mm -hmm. How they ever catch you because they only ever seem to move. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I say, but yeah, but all it's all bloody grave robbing. It's just, isn't it? It's just some of it's done in the name of the British Empire or in the name of the British Museum. Anyway, that's digression. So it's okay for Indiana Jones to do it because he's a very glamorous figure and gets chased by Nazis all the time. Yeah? So he's he's you know being chased like this by the villains, and so that's one view of research is out there in the field. Yeah. <laughs> Very exciting, <laughs> yes. isn't it? You know, genuine, you know, discovery, you know, making your mark on the world and coming back with treasures and, you know, in your, in your travels in the archives, you know, because today, in fact, it's Lucas himself, so he can, has found something that he's extremely proud of. It's very exciting and it's going to change the world, at least for you. <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. And we do this, don't we? You might find things online now that change the world for you, but that, those are the jewels, those are treasures. That makes... That all makes it kind of worthwhile, you know, out there in the world, out there in the field. And then he, he, he runs home and he bursts into his home and there's all the dramatic music suddenly stops dead, doesn't it? And Sean Connery is there, pouring over a medieval manuscript. Where's, where's that? Shall I see you know, joy. Yeah. And he said, oh, you know, stop. And he <coughs> quotes in Latin, you know, he's just finishing it. I thought, well, of course, that's the other side of research, isn't it? The studious side, you know, the, the hermit. You know what I mean? And I, whenever I see now, because I study visual culture a lot now, uh, the, the, the saints, you know, all those saints who went into the wilderness, uh, devoted to their studies, St. Jerome and various others, yeah? I think, well, that's another view of PhD study. But that's not the one you want to promote your programmes on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being a bit gender biased here, because both these examples are... Very masculine, I suppose, in some ways. But, you know, the studious... So you can have the best of both worlds. I think that's my, that's my point of a, a doing PhD work. You can have the, the field work, the exciting, you know, the, the, the excitement in the archives, getting out there, disseminating, talking, you know, making your mark on the world. But it, it's based on that scholarly work, isn't it? Pouring over, well, hopefully, books. But, I mean, increasingly online. And the other thing that's... Uh, there are two things I want to say. If I can get where I am, <laughs> you certainly can. Yeah? <laughs> Trust me. I won't go into a kind of sentimental spiel about my background. <coughs> it was a very humble background. You know, it's a working class lad, mining community in Yorkshire. Okay, I went to a grammar school, but to quote my other Ian's uh, word, it was shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was not a good grammar school. It became a comprehensive fights every day in the playground, you know, etc., etc. I'm not saying that because it's a, you know, a weepy story, but I'm just saying I owe <coughs> everything I am owed to education, yeah. specifically to the 1944 Education Act, but that's you know, that's another story. Um, so if I can do it, you certainly can. And then the other thing that struck me with what Lisa was showing 
was, you know, what's great about this profession? You know, there's lots of things that are not great, you know, of course, but I'm not going to talk about those. What's great about it and what attracts us is, you know, because you can have an intellectual interest in something and it can be something that relates to your own identity and increasingly does, you know, so people's PhD topics reflect their politics, you know, their view of the world. Um, we've seen many examples in recent presentation of how the subjects changed and it in rightly <coughs> changed. So we, we can become emblematic of where the world should be going. And I think that arts and humanities can make a difference. And again, I'm not being sentimental there. I think some of the greatest intellectual works, you know, if one thinks of feminism, for example, so feminist classic, certainly in the 60s and 70s, were nearly all written by English lit professors, maybe not absolutely all, but a lot of them, you know, Germaine Greer, etc., all written by, you know, scholars from, from our background. Um, that you can you can pursue your interests legitimately, you know, and you can put your own values into them. I think that's, you know, I mean, I remember sitting in UCL Library, <laughs> you know, decades ago, of course. Um, I didn't do an MA, by the way. I leapt over that. You didn't have to do an MA in those days. I went straight into the PhD. Um, literally looking at the shelves on 18th century literature and looking for gaps. <laughs> Because I did have an idea, really. I said, where are the gaps? Mm. And I came up with this rather obscure and incredibly boring topic, actually. <laughs> Much more boring than your joy, you know, jouissance uh, 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 topic. And yet, this is the beauty of the combination of, uh, you know, Indiana Jones and Sean Connery, um, is that it changed in the course of the three years. So it was going to be about the ballad revival of the 18th century, which sounds so boring, you fall asleep before you even get past the title, yeah, of that one. Um, and because of one almost off-the-cuff remark by my supervisor, who I only saw once a term, of course, um, uh, with handwritten, you know, handwritten notes and stuff, um, put me on to Thomas Chatterton. And that put me on to literary forgery, yeah? And out of that came a very original thesis on, on literary forgery. Of course, I am a fake. As a, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe a quite a good one, but I'm a, you know, I'm a fake. And now I'm credited with revive of sort of, up there with Umberto Eco, <laughs> sort of faith in fakes, yeah? Um, oh yeah, I've moved on since then. But, you know, so I, I, and I also got two books out of the thesis. How about that, yeah? <laughs> so don't stop at one. Yes. <laughs> Do the book that's in the blue cover that's going to go on Lisa's shelves, yeah, or the library shelves, and then do the bestseller version. Yeah? Because I went on, having done this study of 18th century literary forgery, McPherson, Chatterton, etc., give you eight thousand, uh, the Shakespeare forgery, yeah. Um, and um, and then another almost off the cuff remark, this time by John Sutherland, who we know, yeah, from UCL in those days. He's just chatting over coffee. He said, Oh, he said, I know your stuff on Foyle. He said, Yeah, but thought we're doing a more journalistic type book. You know, the sort that he excelled in, of course, doing bestsellers and, you know, those Jane Austen, Jane Austen mysteries. And I thought, you know, that's a good idea, scratch, scratch. And because Margaret Thatcher was in power, there were no jobs. I was sat in the old reading room. The DL, you know, the big circular one. And I thought, you know, it's not a bad idea. It, ch it chimed in with the Hitler diary scandal, which of course probably no one remembers in the room. John Sonnen remembers. Remember. <laughs> and I just, right, collected newspaper cuttings. Off we went, you know, the apocryphal books of the Bible went in there, you know, and suddenly I had a book that I published with Harvest the Press, who were a very left wing. Actually, I bumped into the uh, I bumped into the founder of Harvester Press a few years ago and reminded him <laughs> that I was one of his authors. Apparently there's an archive now of Harvester Press, which I'll be in, so someone can study me in the archive. <laughs> which is encouraging. So there we, yeah, anyway, I could go on forever. Sometime over a beer, I'll tell you the lowest moment in looking for an academic job. But it is extremely funny. Extremely funny. So, you know, it's like all those things. But it did involve being interviewed in a hotel room in New York. <laughs> <laughs> you want us to ask, don't you? <laughs> We're being recorded. <laughs> um, no names will be mentioned. I don't know if you know, but you used to get 
get jobs in the States. Um, you, had to, you had to go to the MLA conference, okay? Because everyone goes to the MLA conference. And it's always held in, it used to be held between Christmas and New Year. And I was told this at a particular time when the male academics were allowed to travel. This is where I've been told. I'm going back to the 80s. And so, because, because the whole market there was, you know, totally rigged, PhD students would, would be applying for jobs to the different universities. All the jobs are advertised in MLA journal. So I had to, send, I had to subscribe to the you know, MLA journal, because I was so desperate for work. If they're interested in you, you have to go to the MLA conference, right? Because all the academics are there, so rather than spend money getting me to come out to their university, they, they make all the PhD students converge on the venue. It's either New York or San Francisco. Unfortunately, it was New York in January. It was bloody freezing. <laughs> and everyone gets interviewed in, in the hotel rooms where the academics are staying. So, you know, it's bad enough for me, but dread to think of female academics going into a room with those three male professors, two of them sat on the bed. You know, and that, anyway... What's funny about this is, I applied to some pretty prestigious universities, but guess the only one that was interested in me, I'd already got my PhD. The only university that was interested in me was called The Citadel. Well, you know what it is, but I don't know if anyone else does in this room. It's, it's a military academy. Yeah. It's a military <laughs> academy. Now look, won't say a bad word about the military, but you're looking at someone here who'd been a green and common, <laughs> who had spray graffiti in Lambert <laughs> saying no cruise, no trident, yeah. yeah. Spent most of my time campaigning for CND. And I get an interview with a military academy. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, oh, why not, you know. So I <laughs> scraped up the money to get the plane to New York. Unfortunately, I had an old mate of mine who, who, who worked for British Aerospace, also not brilliant, but he'd gone to America. And he lived in New Jersey, so I took the bus to the Port Authority bus station there every day. <laughs> went to the New York Hyatt buses in this posh, posh hotel to be interviewed in this hotel room by Ted Burke. No, I said I wouldn't say any names. <laughs> <laughs> he had his real name and he had a, a more, uh, can I put it, idiomatic name that we gave him. Anyway, I won't, definitely won't say that, yeah. <laughs> and I was being interviewed and the point where it really went wrong, because they were interested in me, because of my uh, PhD and my published two articles by this point, was where they said, oh, by the way, you do realise uh, you become a professor, he said, but actually you get a mock rank. <laughs> so I, you know, lieutenant or, you know, <laughs> captain. And I said, what? So you go into the room and they salute? He said, oh, yeah. You know, you go into the room and salute and you, you have to wear, you know, you have to wear uniform. <laughs> and I, at that point, I said, this sounds a bit bizarre. <laughs> 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 at which point, you know, I thought, mm. and sure enough, later on, I get a letter saying, Having said to me you were top of the pile, I've gone down to second. <laughs> That's how bad it got. But I stuck at it, you know. And indeed, Roehampton, when I got invited to do a speech at the course of the BL on the Nancy Olympia, that put me in really good stead, you know, for, for, for the subsequent career. So I know they went into further education. You know, I was quite sort of tendy with further education elsewhere. Quite attracted by it. It's both compulsory, isn't it? 16 plus, lots of adult students. Quite enjoyed that, nearly got into that, got interviewed, didn't get the job, one of those serendipitous moments, didn't get the job, and then a couple of years after, you know, got not here, I got a job at what's now Blue Now. Um, but you know, it, it was it was obviously meant to be, wasn't it? It was. You know. So sorry to go on, but there we are. I thought I'd regale you a bit. You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Thank you.